I'm Joe Apgar, Chief Operating Officer of Palatania. The episode you've selected will begin in a moment, but first I wanted to tell you how you could have an impact on innovative cancer research right now. COVID-19 has altered so many of our lives, but as a cancer survivor myself, I have learned that life is learning to adapt to a series of events. We were all looking forward to our traditional ride weekend in early August, but we had to adapt and find a way to channel the spirit, the commitment, and the inspiration of this community into a new reimagined experience. This year, we are proud to introduce My Pelotonia, an opportunity for you to personally define what Pelotonia means to you through setting goals, big and small, and challenging yourself to do something. It could be you want to accomplish something new, improve your health, run, ride your bike, sew masks for family and friends, or perform random acts of kindness for those in need. Whatever it is, you set your challenge and fundraising goal. You determine your Pelotonia this year. You make it happen. 2020 will not be defined by COVID-19. Instead, we will show the world and define this year by our perseverance, our commitment to raising money for cancer research, and our creativity. There is so much more to my Pelotonia, so get involved today. Visit pelotonia.org or click the link in the show notes. That's pelotonia.org. Together, we will rise. Um, but what I gave him was a Superman t-shirt. Um, and I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, in my life, when I've worn this shirt, it makes me feel invincible. And hopefully uh, you can take some of my strength for your journey ahead. Welcome to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia. We're a community dedicated to funding innovative cancer research through a three-day experience of cycling and volunteering. I'm your host and COO of Pelotonia, Joe Apgar. Your journey with us to the finish line begins now. Pelotonia is powered by an amazing community, and it's through research that we will see an end to cancer. We want to thank our major funding partners, the American Electric Power Foundation, Huntington, the L Brands Foundation, and Peggy and Richard Santulli. It's because of them in this dedicated community that all of this is possible. Every year, we love seeing the creativity of every member of our community. There are so many Pelotons and individuals who put their own unique flair on display. Things from decorated helmets, purple tutus, and even painted bikes. The creativity of the Pelotonia community is endless. However, you may have noticed one rider in particular dressed in a Superman costume. That's Patrick Rogers, a dedicated comic book and sci-fi fan. He even named his daughter Leia after the character in Star Wars. While Patrick's costume is an homage to his favorite superhero, he puts on the outfit to honor another Man of Steel in his life. So let's learn about Patrick and the meaning behind the suit he wears in this episode, Dan's Superman. So I grew up uh, a comic book fan, Star Wars, all those nerd things from the 80s. Um, and I've always worn Superman t-shirts, um, dating back to when I was probably in eighth grade. I have a whole drawer at my house with nothing but Superman t-shirts in it. It's kind of my trademark. Um, and when I first started training for Pelotonia, uh, I posted on social media my first ride, and I was wearing a Superman shirt. And then every subsequent ride, I'd wear a different superhero. So I would wore Batman, I wore Wonder Woman, I wore uh, DC superheroes. Okay. Yeah, I'm a DC guy. I was on Team Buckeye uh, on the eye pedal uh, Peloton, and we get the Buckeye shirts. But I don't know, part of me was like, I want to stand out. I want to be able to be noticed. And it just seemed natural. Everyone's out there in these tight-fitting clothes. Well, I'll just order myself a Superman costume, and I'll dress as Superman. And, and this was right. head to toe. This was not just a T-shirt. This no, was head this to was toe gear. long pants, long sleeves, uh, even underpants on top, the red underpants on top. Uh, so it was the whole shebang. Um, people said, isn't it going to be hot? Um, but it's not. Uh, it blocks the sun. So That's a uh, bonus. Yeah, um, and it's great. So I wore that. The, the, uh, someone from the dispatch noticed me sitting there my first year before, um, and she interviewed me. Um, uh, and 
When I rode that first time, the first thing I noticed was everybody along the route is cheering for everyone. The support's amazing. Everyone, anyone that's ridden knows this. Anyone that's sat and watched it knows it. But what I got to experience was every single person on that route cheered to me individually. Yeah, they were cheering I, for Superman. Yeah, I'd go past and be, hey, Superman, it's Superman. Uh, and, you know, when you're struggling and it's hot and you're out of breath and you're like, I can't pedal anymore, someone yells, hey, Superman. And, you know, that's the little boost you need to just pedal a couple more times until someone does it again. That's so cool. So... You first rode, you rode 45 miles in 2018 and, and sort of did that in honor of your father. I did. Yeah, so can you share that story and his sort of cancer journey and how sure. you ended up really celebrating his life with that first ride? Yeah, so my father was diagnosed with duodenal cancer in June of 2017, um, and we lost him on February 10th of 2018. My dad was a cyclist. He liked to go ride bikes. Um, he had given it up in the last couple years of his life because he had a shoulder injury, but prior to that, uh, he loved going out on the road and riding bikes. I never did it with him. It wasn't a shared hobby. I had no interest in riding a bike uh, at all. But when he passed away, I said, I'm going to ride his bike in Pelotonia uh, in his honor. And I got my brother to join me, my brother Philip. Uh, signed up with me. We signed up to ride 100 miles. Luckily, in one of my training rides, I realized that ain't going to happen for me. Um, so I elected to just finish the 45. I still raised almost $5,000. Yeah, which year, is amazing. But, um, but I rode the 45. Um, so that's kind of how I got involved and why I decided to do it. Um, it just seemed to line up. So let's talk about the some of the really big milestones or moments in your dad's cancer journey that, that you got to be a part of. Uh, the first big moment, I think, was when he was diagnosed. He was still at uh, University Hospital because they, they had thought it was uh, an ulcer, and the biopsy came back, and it was um, cancer. It's funny to say I was lucky, but I was lucky to be there because in my almost 20 years working at the medical center, I've never had a meeting in Rhodes Hall on a patient floor, ever. And I had one that day. So I was in my parents' room right before the meeting, and I said, hey, I gotta run down this meeting, I'll be back in an hour. And I walked in the, me the meeting room, and my mom texted me and said, can you come back up to the room? And I just knew right then and there. And at that point, they were still fairly optimistic. The scans looked good. It looked like it hadn't spread. And so they set up a Whipple surgery. And my whole family was there, and we were in the waiting room. Um, and they said it would be a long surgery, four or five hours. So we brought some food. We brought some dominoes to play. Um, and so we're sitting there in the waiting room, and here comes the doctor 35 minutes later. Um, and I knew um, that's not good. They said it spread to his liver. Um, it spread a lot. Um, and they told us then and there that he probably had six months to live. I remember feeling the need to be strong instantly. Um, you know, I, I remember my mother breaking down and crying and my siblings. But I remember being stone-faced because I thought to myself, wow, we're, 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 we're hitting it now. They transferred him to the James, um, and his two best friends came up, uh, Jane and Pat Highland, who are like family to us. And I, they texted us that they were there, so I went down the hall to meet them. Um, and I saw them coming, and I started crying. I broke down crying. And I hugged them, and Pat said to me, it's okay to cry now, but you're in charge now. And I took that to heart. Now I really had a lot on my plate that I had to, I didn't want my parents to stress about anything. Um, and so I took that on myself to start being in charge, um, taking care of appointments, taking care of uh, paperwork, doing things that we needed to do. And I don't by any stretch mean to imply that I did it all because I didn't. We had a support system that was amazing. Um, my siblings, uh, our friends, our family friends, um, I could say Jane and Pat, were, they went above and beyond in a way that, that to the day I die, I'll never be able to pay them back for the, 
the help that they provided my family, um, just the whole community coming together. At that point, um, we had options, um, and we, my dad decided to fight it. He decided that he was going to go through chemo and be a fighter. Yeah, and so, you know, you had the opportunity to really sort of make the connection with your dad with a, with a special gift that you gave to him along his journey, and what was that? The day before his first chemo, we had a big family reunion party. And so I met my parents at uh, a cousin's house, uh, and I had a gift for him, and I gave it to him to take home with him. Um, I didn't want him to open it in front of me because I didn't think I could handle it. Um, but what I gave him was a Superman T-shirt. Um, and I wrote him a letter, and I said, you know, in my life, when I've worn this shirt, it makes me feel invincible. And hopefully uh, you can take some of my strength for your journey ahead. He went through two rounds of chemo. Um, it was rough. I remember one example of his positivity was, you know, he was stuck in the hospital after the initial surgery, um, and he was up on a high floor, the 17th floor or something of the James, um, and it was over the 4th of July. And so he got to sit there and watch Red, White, and Boom from his hospital room. And it's he a good said, view. Yeah, he said, isn't this great? Like, if, if I didn't have cancer, we wouldn't get to sit here and watch this. And there's a great picture of he and my brother and my mom wearing neon necklaces, um, smiling in his hospital gown, watching the fireworks out the window. So then we went back in December um, after the second round of chemo, after the scans, to see... Uh, what had happened. And at this point, he was pretty beat up. My whole family came to that visit. That was the first time all of my siblings and I were at a doctor visit. Our doctor was Dr. Van Dusen, and he was an amazing doctor. Um, and he came in to talk to us, and he said, you know, the scans don't look good. The chemo is not doing what we, what we hoped it would do. And again, everyone, you know, was upset. And uh, I felt like I had to hold it together because um, now it was really in our face. Could be weeks, could be months. It ended up being about a little over two months. Um, but we had Christmas coming up, so we got home and we, we all pitched in. We got things together. We moved my parents' bedroom from the second floor to the first floor. Um, we created sort of a dormitory in their old master bedroom with a bunch of twin beds for all the grandkids so that they could all be around. Um, you know, we all kind of banded together, and, and those were the last months of his life. And we had a wonderful Christmas together, um, lots of smiles, lots of laughter, love, telling stories, never feeling sorry for ourselves. And just the grace and strength that he exhibited, you know, you hear a lot about people. I think people in general are stronger than we, any of us realize. You constantly hear people describe individuals going through this and they say, you know, they never said, why me? It was, why not me? And that was my dad, you know, why not me? Why not? Why shouldn't it be me? Better me than you, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and that was really profound to, to witness and inspiring to see that kind of strength. That's a kind of strength you don't get to unless you're a cancer doctor or, you know, a healthcare professional, but not all of us get to run into on a daily basis. And so getting to experience that enhanced my life in a way that nothing else would have. As dark as things ever seem, as, as, as horrible as things seem, um, if you look hard enough, you can find a positive to take away. Is being really intentional about your time together and... Exactly, yeah. Uh, appreciating the little moments, every little thing. Um, really appreciating every, every word of advice he gave. My brother, I think it was Alex, said to him, Dad, you know, what advice do you have for me um, when you're gone? What, what, what can you tell me that's going to help me? And my dad said, it's really simple, Alex. Be kind and show love to people. And so that's become sort of our family motto at this point. My brother got it tattooed. It's uh, powerful. Yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah. Uh, my nephew, um, who... Unfortunately, never got to meet my dad. My sister-in-law was pregnant with him while my dad was sick. Um, and his middle name is my dad's name. It's Brooks Daniel. He's got, a, he's got that up and hanging up in his room. It says, be kind and show love to people. Go back and talk about your dad mm -hmm. a little bit. And sort of, can you 
sort of paint the picture, uh, you know, in our minds for who your dad was, what sure. was his personality, what was yeah. he like, what did he do? Yeah. Uh, so my dad, uh, he was a really funny guy, uh, really witty. Um, he would always be the first to make a sarcastic or witty comment. Um, we grew up, I have three brothers and one sister, so there were six of us all together with my mom. Um, but we also grew up with a very close-knit group of friends. My parents' best friends, they've known since grade school and high school, and their kids are my best friends now. So he was always a smart aleck, um, and everyone knew that about him and loved it about him. And um, as he lay, you know, as it was near the end in Christmas time of 2017, you know, he could barely walk. He sat in his chair all the time, um, very frail and thin. Um, and every December, this group of friends would get together and go out to dinner, um, my dad and all his friends. Um, and so he couldn't go out to dinner with them that night. So they all came to the house. And I was at home helping take care of my dad, so I was there. And they all stopped by. And so they sat around uh, joking and just reminiscing um, and laughing and having a good time. And my dad was kind of in and out of it, um, you know, because he was tired and he was, you know, he'd kind of fall asleep a little bit. And at one point, one of our friends, I won't say her name, but she'll know who I'm talking about. She was talking about she had come across some old home movies of them as a group. And she was like, oh, I was so awful back then. Did any of you realize how awful I was? And then from a dead sleep, my dad just raised his hand. <laughs> and everyone just started cracking up because they were like, that's Danny. That's, yeah. that's exactly the kind of thing that he would do. You rode 45 miles the first year uh, in 2018. Uh, we were very fortunate to have you come back and ride the next year, 2019, uh, where you did 100 miles. Yep. Describe just training for that and um, sort of how you, you know, would wear your costumes during training and all that. So uh, what I learned from the first year, the first year my brother and I rode a lot of trails. We rode the Olentangy Trail and the Allen Creek Trail. Um, I have a coworker who has since retired, but his name's John Turvey, and he's a big Pelotonia supporter. He's ridden in it every single year. And so I would pester him every day with questions. What should I do? What, what about this? What kind of equipment do I need? Um, and finally, I gave in and decided to go out on the road with him one Saturday morning. Uh, it was him, and it was my CIO, Phyllis Teeter. Uh, they let me ride with them. And I wasn't 10 minutes into it, and I was like, there's no way I can ride 100 miles. What I didn't realize was these trails. I'd ride 50, 60 miles on these trails. And I'd be like, I'm doing great, but there's no hills. Right, yeah, um, it's flat. Yep, and as soon as I hit that road, I was like, wow, I'm in trouble. Um, so for 2019, I knew better, and I knew uh, what I had to do. And so I spent a lot of time with John Turvey and some other coworkers. I also got in shape. Um, when I rode in 2018, uh, I was 263 pounds, and I eventually got down to 195. Um, so when I was training, I had already lost about 50 pounds, um, and it made life a lot easier. I felt more comfortable on the bike. I felt more athletic. My stamina was better. So no more trails. Come ride day, uh, it wasn't, I won't say it was easy. That last 15 was a lot harder than I had ever been led to believe. Um, and at the end of the ride that year was my mom and all her grandchildren, all seven of her grandchildren oh, waiting cool. for us right there at the bench there at the end. Um, and they had signs that said, ride for Pap, yep. uh, which was what they called my dad. Um, and so we stopped before we crossed the finish line. I hugged my daughter, um, and it was really special. And then we rode across that finish line. Uh, and had a beer. And, yeah, uh, yeah. It felt great. I yeah. mean, we were worn out, but uh, it felt great. Um, my father-in-law wanted to be involved. Um, he was a rider, a cyclist. Um, he rode big, long rides up in the Chicago area and the Wisconsin area. Um, and he wasn't quite looking to ride 100 miles with us. So what he did, he followed us the entire route. Um, and so we had extra stops. Um, he'd say, okay, I'll meet you 15 miles ahead up at this church. Um, and he'd be there waiting with coolers of water and food. And other people started stopping. You know, they'd see us stopping and they'd stop. So he followed us the whole route. Um, and it was amazing. You know, Pelotonia does a great ride, job supporting the ride. The stops are all great. But we had a little bit extra just, yeah, uh, just to, help, to help kick us, you know, past the finish line. 
So you and your two brothers finished together and rode the whole whole, whole hundred whole yeah. round together. So uh, did you have any fun, good conversations, sort of along the route, reminiscing about your dad and sort of yeah, you know, yeah. what he might have thought of you guys sort yeah. of out here drudging through a hundred miles when it was his hobby, right? It was. You know, I think we we talked more at the opening ceremony. Um, a real special moment for us was when we went to the board and wrote down his name. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really powerful thing, I think, when you write down those names of who you ride for. Yeah, so these um, are our, you know, why I ride boards. Yeah. And they're lined up on the street. Right. And there's thousands of names on them. Right. And, and the sad part about that is I had more names this year than last year. And that's hard, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's not people, we've, all people we've lost. I ride for the people that are out there still fighting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's a moment when we took to reflect and think about my dad and think about what he would think of his three sons uh, undertaking this. Yeah. It's kind of crazy to think about that the three of us would be out there on bicycles for 100 miles. 100 miles I mean, in the middle of August. Yeah, you might as well say we were going to fly to the moon, especially me. So did your other two brothers participate in the superhero uh, outfits. They don't. The they don't. Now. They they wear our. They represent Team Buckeye and wear the Team Buckeye jerseys. Okay. Um, I've tried to get them to do something different. I tried to get them to be. Uh, I tried to talk them into being Batman and Robin. My my brother Philip actually suggested that he and I ride a tandem bike dressed as Batman and Robin. Um, which I love the idea of the visual of that. I think it would be hilarious. It'd be, uh, a, it'd be an amazing yes, photograph. Yes, but I can't imagine being on a tandem bike for 100 miles, so I nixed that one. Yeah, so, that's funny. Uh, but, hey, anybody out there that wants to do it, I, I, I recommend get, get yourself a superhero costume yeah. and throw it on. You and your family, your brothers, your sister, your mom, do you guys do anything to sort of celebrate and honor your dad to this day? We think about him a lot. Uh, we talk about him. Um, I think it's important to always talk about him and tell stories about him. My daughter was only uh, two and a half years old when he passed. Um, and so we talk about Pap constantly. Yeah, yeah just um, to build her memory. And yeah, and it's almost like he's still there. You know, she talks about him like he's still there. Um, and she'll tell me she has dreams about him. She's four years old now. Um, when he first got diagnosed, when he was still relatively healthy and hadn't started chemo, um, I asked my mom and dad to come up, and my wife and I, we took my daughter to the zoo with my parents. Um, and we have a picture of just my daughter and my dad walking together, holding hands. Um, and we've got that blown up in her room, uh, and we refer back to that picture all the time. Remember that day we went to the zoo with Pap? And she says, yeah, yeah, I remember that. He bought me a gorilla. Um, That's funny. And as we were leaving that day, as we were leaving the zoo that day, he said to me, Patrick, this was a good day. Yeah, so you're, you mentioned your professional career. So you work at the Ohio State Medical Center. You're sort of in data science and, and research. And just can you talk about how sort of the intersection of your dad's experience and having cancer and seeing that firsthand and now having that opportunity to support yeah. researchers and the science that's really pushing the needle forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I felt very lucky that, uh, that I worked where I did when my dad got sick. Um, because I was able to be at the hospital every day uh, with him. Um, I was able to work from his hospital room. Uh, I was able to set up meetings over in the hospital. So I got to be a part of it, and I got to help them navigate that. At that point when he was diagnosed, I had been there uh, 17 years. But I never saw it from the other side. You know, I always, I don't work with patients. I work with data behind the scenes. I help uh, load the data warehouse um, and provision data for people who need to ask questions and do analysis on a myriad of topics. Um, but this allowed me to see it from the other side. And so seeing it from that other side, it gave me an appreciation for what patients go through. Um, all I see is data every day. Um, but it really gave me a chance to connect that to the human beings that all of that data represents. Um, and that's an awesome responsibility uh, when you think about it. Um, every one of those lines of code is someone's mother, someone's daughter, someone's right, brother, yeah, someone's person. dad. Yeah. Um, and so what an awesome obligation we have. But also an incredible opportunity that we get to have to 
um, make all of that mean something. I like to say we're all on the same team there. We're all one giant team at the Med Center. Um, and the, getting to affect people's lives in such an intimate and personal way um, is really lucky. Um, not, a, not everyone gets to have that experience, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, and it's why I love working there. Yeah, I mean, it's a world-class institution, and it's, I mean, it's making just really game-changing discoveries and mm-hmm. research findings every day. And yeah. it's, you know, it's cool to have it right here in Columbus. And, yeah. you know, sometimes we take it for granted, but it's really is a world-class institution. What would your dad say to you today? Sort of if he, if he knew mm-hmm. you embarked on this Pelotonia journey and, yeah. you know, you were dressing up in Superman spandex and he saw you at the finish line, what do you think he'd say? Well, I think first he'd laugh at me. He would think that it was silly that I was dressed like that. But he'd roll his eyes and realize, yeah, of course Patrick was going to wear a Superman costume uh, to ride in this thing. But I think he would be incredibly proud. I think that he would see – I think that he would be – proud and I think that he would feel humbled that we're doing it for him. Um, I think that he would feel the love that we have as we do this for him. Um, And I just think that he would be proud and he would be humbled by the love that he feels from us. You know, thinking back to your Superman uh, roots, as we'll call them, and when you think about Superman and you think about giving that shirt to your dad, like, like what? What's that mean to you, sort of now? Every time you look at sort of the Superman logo, you're wearing yeah, one right now. Yeah. Um, like, does that have new special meaning? It does. I mean, I see, I see Superman, and this is going to sound cheesy, but you know, it, he's a symbol of hope. He's what we all aspire to be. You know, he's he does. He's super not because of his powers, but because of how he chooses to use them. Um, and so we all have that ability. We all have something that we can do, and it's just deciding to make a choice to use that ability for good, uh, for the betterment of mankind. Uh, And so that's how I see Superman when I think about it. Um, He's a symbol of hope, and he, you know, sure, he's a a kid's character, but we can all relate to... uh, to wanting to do more, to wanting to affect the people we come into contact with every day. Um, And so that's sort of how I view that symbol. It's a symbol of hope to me. And that's what I hope people get when they see me in that costume, riding. They see me and they say, there's Superman, and they recognize that symbol of hope. Thanks to Patrick once more for taking the time to tell his amazing story. You can hear many more empowering journeys by subscribing to this podcast now and checking out season one wherever you are listening to this. Also, we want to thank our major funding partners again. The American Electric Power Foundation, Peggy and Richard Santulli, Huntington, and the Brands Foundation. This is what's next on One Goal. I got inspired by this show where this girl who was suffering from cancer um, lost her hair, so her friend shaved her head in solidarity with her. So I decided that I wanted to shave my head in solidarity with people who are in hospitals right now. You've been listening to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia. The first half of season two will be hosted by me, Chief Operating Officer of Pelotonia, Joe Apgar with interview and production scheduling by our marketing and communications team duo, Emily Smith and Gabby Blower. Produced, mixed, and sound designed at the studios of Wessler Media by Vince Tornero. Additional mastering by Joey Gerwin at Orin Judio. Special thank you to all of our guests for being so open and willing to share their amazing stories. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, as that will help others hear these empowering journeys. If you're curious about joining the Pelotonia community, please see the link in the episode notes or visit pelotonia.org. That's pelotonia.org.